We've been looking at this study on time to lead. Uh, we have a leadership deficit. We don't have a deficit of titles and positions and offices and job descriptions and people who want to identify, self-identify as leaders, but, but leaders are those individuals who are willing to take a stand. And because of that and the utilization of their influence, those around them arrive at a better place. We have a shortage of that. And in, in the midst of the season that we're walking through, we need God's people to be awakened to their assignment. Some of us are really good leaders in arenas beyond our faith. You can lead in a business arena or an academic arena or in an athletic arena or in social places, but when it comes to your faith, you often lack, we've often lacked the courage we need. We didn't feel like we had enough biblical background or enough spiritual insight or we wanted another training course or we didn't want to bring the division that it brings. We've been coached for decades not to talk about faith and politics. What garbage. I hope on a daily basis you talk to the people you're around about both your faith and what you see happening in our culture. Not advocating for candidates or parties, that's not my assignment, but to talk about the truth of God in our culture is every bit of our assignment. That's the truth. We are in a season of, in my lifetime, unprecedented turmoil. It was introduced to us with COVID, but that has stepped into the background for the, for the most part. But there is something far more um, disruptive that's been unleashed amongst us. And with just a casual glance around us, you, you don't have to look carefully or listen carefully you know, from an open border and the, the chaos that that's creating and the emboldening of violence and lawlessness and the things that are flooding across our border that are taking hundreds of thousands of American lives more deadly than a virus. The lawlessness that is sweeping across our nation it touched our community this week. Uh, the economy, the intentional dismantling of our economy. I don't believe you could make the decisions that are being made accidentally and be this destructive. And that, that, that's not about a party or an individual, folks. That, that crosses the aisles. That hasn't happened in the last 18 months or two years. So whoever you're advocating for, don't get torqued up. Our problems are, the, the root of our problems are not political. The root of our problems are spiritual. The church has failed to be salt and light. And it's our time to wake up. So don't be angry at the politicians. Get on your knees in the quiet places in your life, in your home, and begin to talk to the Lord about the indifference you've had. That we've, been, we've lived presumptively. We've just imagined that our children and grandchildren should have escalating standards of living because it was a divine right. And there's some goofy person that wants a title and they'll promise you that, but those things don't come from political parties or from governments, they come from the hand of God. And the, the dismantling of our economy, the dismantling of our fuel sources under the guise of environmental protection is just fundamentally dishonest. The confusion they're introducing around our biological sex, it's not confusing. It really isn't. I grew up in a barn in Tennessee and there wasn't any confusion in the barns. <laughs> now, I don't doubt that there are, I don't doubt that there are some people who struggle with confusion around that and upon, I have compassion for that, but it's not something to make normative and introduce to our children, encourage them to be confused. That's wicked. Amen. And we better find our voice. Our public schools and what's happening with the children in those places, if they're not your children, folks, they're the children for whom we're responsible. And the content of what's being taught in those classrooms, I'm ashamed, I've told you this and I mean it. For the decades I was silent while my faith wasn't welcome. If there was one objection to somebody expressing a Christian faith in a classroom, it had to be eliminated entirely. We've been told and we accepted it. We were wrong because now they're introducing worldviews into the classrooms that are objectionable to many of us. And we're, they're not being silenced because we object, we're being removed from the arena. So we have to have the courage to say that the tolerance we had was not an expression of good thing, it was a lack of courage on our part. We didn't care enough about our faith to say it's an important part of the training of our children. And so now we're standing at a place where both in the, in the, our local schools and the, the, the university settings, 
We abandoned them a long time ago. Mind you, when I, I mean, when I was going through those portals, and that's, that's been a, a year or two, <laughs> what was being taught in those places, even in the, the theological seminaries, was apostasy. And you, if you've been in, in higher education, you know that to be true. And we've just been quiet and turned our eyes the other way and talked about the experience of college. Folks, we're in a season of turmoil. But the solution has to come from the hearts of God's people. Let's decide we're going to lead so well in the place where we are that we will give it such attention, such focus, such determination that we will talk about our faith, talk about what's happening in our world, that it would please God to respond in a much broader way around us simply because of the choices you're making. Let's stop saying we're powerless. Let's stop saying we don't have enough influence. Let's stop saying we don't have enough resources. Let's stop focusing on the strength of our adversary and start turning our attention to the authority and the power of the God we worship. Amen. It's time. I, I want to, in, in this session and the, the next, God willing, I want to stay on this theme of time to lead, but I want to take some lessons from the Exodus. I hope you're doing the Bible reading with us. If you're not, why not? And please don't tell me you did it. That's a little bit like saying I ate. Well, I'm grateful that you had food available, but I suspect you'd like some in your future. And Jesus said that we don't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the fact that you may have read your Bible is not adequate. You need time with the word of God in the midst of this season to navigate. Not simply today, I think there's, what's ahead of us is more difficult than what we've seen thus far. And you're going to need the stability and the truth and the counsel and the wisdom of Scripture. We're in the book of Genesis right now with our daily Bible reading. If you're not in the habit, when the website or the apps It'll give you those portions. But I wanted to take some lessons from Exodus because it's in our immediate future. And it is the greatest deliverance story in all of the Bible until we get to the redemptive work of Jesus. And it is used throughout the New Testament as a pattern for us. In fact, I want to begin there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And for you biblical scholars, you will recognize that's a New Testament portion. So I'm not just taking you back to the, the depths of the Old Testament. You know, some people say to me, oh, I don't want to read those books of Moses. They're so dry. Not if you know the story. Amen. Hollywood's made a fortune off of those stories. First Corinthians 10, verse 1. I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers. If, you know, just as a, just a suggestion, if there's something that the Bible says don't be ignorant about, <laughs> learn about that. Aren't I deep? I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. That Exodus generation was led by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, the Red Sea event you know about. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Did you know Jesus was a part of that Exodus generation? Come on. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now we have to pause there just a moment. I don't know there's any generation in all of human history that was more closely aligned with the supernatural involvement of God than that Exodus generation. From the plagues upon Egypt to the parting of the Red Sea to the manna on a daily basis. I mean, on and on and on it goes. It wasn't that they were separate from the supernatural working of God. You see, one of the mistakes that has lived very large within contemporary Christendom in America is that if God moved more in some more significant way, then we would step forward. I have to tell you that biblical history does not support that notion. And this generation is the sterling example in the midst of all the supernatural provision and interaction and activity of God. The majority of them chose not to cooperate. The majority of them chose not to cooperate. I'm asking you to consider your God decisions. What is the evidence that you're a Christ follower? If it's historical evidence, I would ask you to reconsider your position. There needs to be evidence 
from this season of your life. There needs to be fruitfulness. There needs to be activity, behaviors, words, things in which you're engaged that are the evidence of fruit of the presence of the Spirit of God within you, not some historical activity that you point at. I'm grateful for those things. I don't want to diminish them. But I think it's worth noting that it says God was not pleased with his people. Verse six. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us. What happened to that generation is an example to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And then we're warned about some very specific things. Do not be idolaters as some of, their, some of them were. It is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. So let's think of idolatry in a little different way. You typically think of it as bowing down or worshiping something carved from stone or wood or perhaps cast from metal. But the imagery that's used here is that they was hedonism. Eat, drink, and be merry. No limits. A descent into paganism. It's the language that's used. It would be difficult to find a more apt description of current American culture. What we're watching is the descent into paganism. We won't even accept boundaries around marriage, around family. Verse 8, we should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples for us and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Their story has been recorded to help us not duplicate their mistakes. So if you think you were standing firm, be careful then that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Amen. Remember Mother Teresa? I read a comment she made once. I didn't know her personally, but in light of that scripture where God won't let you be tempted more than you can bear, she responded once that she wished God didn't have so much confidence in her. <laughs> but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So the author, Paul, is writing to the church in Corinth and he's referencing the Exodus generation and their experiences saying that those things have been written down as a warning to us. So it's on your immediately upcoming reading list. And I thought I would take a couple of sessions and see if we could look at it in a little more detail, perhaps to make those next few weeks of reading a bit more fruitful and to help us with the decisions we're making. Because the reality is those things that are listed there, the idolatry or the, the hedonism or the, the pursuit of pleasure, comfort and convenience before yielding to the Lordship of Jesus and his authority in our lives. You see, fundamentally idolatry is giving anything precedence above the Lordship of Jesus. Even if it's our pleasure or our comfort or our happiness, I'd have to say we see an abundance of that type of behavior or immorality, sexual immorality within the church. Folks, we've, we've had a very difficult time finding the courage to say to our culture that from a godly perspective, there are things that are simply immoral. We don't have to be angry or condemning or diminishing, but we have to have the courage to sell, tell the truth. If you go to the doctor and he makes a diagnosis, he's not belittling you. He's telling you the truth. You see, we've believed the lie that was turned around and you don't have a right to judge. I'm not judging anybody. I'm simply telling you from God's perspective, there are some things that are not good for me and I don't believe they're good for you. You've got to be willing to lead in that way. And it starts in your home with the people you're closest to. I know the answer. We don't want to disrupt the family thing. We don't want somebody to be unhappy. We don't want them to make a scene. We don't want to draw any attention. We're just going to go along. Well, we have to decide what we believe about eternity. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing. I, and I don't want to treat it lightly. And I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to create anger. 
I want to create within you an awareness. We can't continue on this path and expect God's deliverance. We're not here because we voted for the wrong person. We're at the end of a downward trajectory that we've been building the rails for for a long, long time. And we've got to decide we will yield to the authority of Jesus. Those people whose bodies were scattered across the Negev desert, they didn't get there in a day with a single decision. It didn't happen because they, they, they had a one-time argument with Mo. There was a whole trajectory of things that landed them there. So let's start with just some the big rock ideas around this Exodus generation. Where do we find it? We're in Genesis right now if you're doing the reading, but in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. Those are your, I'm sure those are five of your very favorite books. <laughs> but if we can put them against the backdrop of this Exodus event, I believe you'll find them to have a far greater application to your understanding of the unfolding of Scripture. They're slightly different perspectives, different viewpoints. They hold different highlights, but they're all describing what happened with this group of people who have been slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years and through the supernatural involvement of God are released. And because God inexplicably, there's no real fundamental explanation provided, God decides to make them his own people. The creator of heaven and earth says, I'll take this group of people and say to all the world, they're mine. I'll show you what it means to have a relationship with the holy God, a righteous God. Imagine that. And that's what that narrative is about. He didn't deliver them from the brick pits of Egypt just so they could do whatever they jolly well wanted to once they got free. And Jesus didn't die on a cross so you could be delivered from the hand of Satan just so you could lead your life any way you wanted to. That's a perversion of the gospel. Freedom comes by choosing Jesus as Lord of our lives. So it's in those books that we get that story. Now, who you're going to find in those books, you're going to find some leaders, you'll find some grumblers, you'll find some rebels, some adversaries, some allies, some learners, you'll find those who fail and repent, and you'll find those who fail and refuse to repent. It'll look a lot like a collection of folks like us. In fact, if, if you'll read those chapters with your pen, you could probably put names with contemporary people and relationships. The plot line is intriguing. It's a story born in adversity. The Exodus story begins with the cries of the, the Hebrew people in Egypt being tormented by the Egyptians. And the cries come to God. So it begins out of great adversity. It's grounded in the power and the faithfulness of God. It's just almost every page is this demonstration that there is a God, that he has a plan for our lives that's better than our own. Amen. One that we struggle to understand. It's, just, it's on the periphery of our consciousness and it's not easy for us to bring it into the center of our awareness and live that way. It's crowded. The whole narrative is crowded with the inconsistency of our hearts. We struggle. When you read it, you'll think these have to be the slowest people God has ever recruited. <laughs> Until you get far enough into it and you think, oh... I would have fit in with that crowd. It's about the inconsistencies of our own hearts. And it illustrates in some very tangible ways the conflict involved if you intend to experience God's best. You see, if you want God's best in your life, if you're going to join him in seeing his purposes come into the earth, it's what Jesus taught us to pray, wasn't it? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, if you're going to take that as a purpose for your life, you need to understand that will not be emerged through your experience easily. It won't be any more easily accomplished for you or for me than it was for the Exodus generation. I mean, the obvious beginning point, and I'll start there, was getting out of Egypt. That was their goal. They said, we just don't want to be here anymore. We're mistreated. We have no rights or we have very limited rights. We no longer want to be in, in this relationship in the way it's defined, and we've asked God to get us out. Look at Exodus 5. It wasn't an easy exit. You know, there's not an easy exit for sin in your life or mine. It took the incarnate Son of God. 
It took more than a worship service or a church or a theological system or a systematic theology or a style of worship or a favorite chorus for you and I to escape the bondage of sin. Sin is our master apart from the redemptive work of Jesus. And for that freedom to come to you and to me, it required the incarnate son of God to come to the earth. And he had to exhaust the punishment that was due my godlessness and my rebellion so that I might receive the blessings that were due his perfect obedience. That's what that whole cross story is all about. Well, in Exodus 5, we're at kind of the beginning chapter, the first few chapters, the first four chapters of Exodus are Moses' story, introducing us to that character and how he was so uniquely positioned. But in 5, Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, you're lazy. That's why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get the work. You'll not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite foreman realized they were in trouble when they were told, you're not to reduce the number of bricks required for you each day. And they left Pharaoh and they found Moses and Aaron. Uh, I want you to start to get the characters lined up because in these first chapters of Exodus, Pharaoh's at the center. He is the voice of authority that is impeding their exit. And the Israelite foremen have something to say about it, the leaders of these tribes. And then Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. You've made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Now, some of you know the narrative. Moses didn't get here because he wanted to. He's tried. It didn't work out well. God recruited him in a rather dramatic way, right? Burning bush, staff, snake, staff again, hand in your jacket, leprous, hand back, clean again. I don't talk plain, shut up, he'll talk for you. You remember that story? So this wasn't like Moses was going, oh, me, me, me. He was doing quite the opposite. I don't want to go. I've been there. I know how powerful Pharaoh is and I'm no match. I don't want to go. And God sends him and he accepts the assignment and now he's back and they're looking at him going, you have made us a stench to Pharaoh. And Moses returned to the Lord. I bet he did. Why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's brought trouble upon this people. And you have not rescued your people at all. Now remember our goal here, we're trying to understand how to lead through seasons of turmoil. And, and all of us have been indoctrinated to this idea, well, that if you pray once, poof. And I have to say, there have been some prayers that I prayed one time and the Lord responded to, but that would not be the normative pattern of my relationship with the Lord. We've had a faith so dictated by convenience, comfort, ease. We get mad at God if it didn't go in the way we wanted to go. Really? We're going to look at that in some more detail. Next chapter, chapter six. This is what God says, tells Moses to say to the Israelites. Say to them, I'm the Lord. He's going to, God's going to make seven statements about what he will do. He says it, I will. It's repeated seven times. See if you can catch them all. I'm the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. Then you will know that I'm the Lord your God and who brought you out from under the yoke of Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you as a possession. I'm the Lord. Did you get in all seven? I'll bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you. It intrigues me. He said, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with acts of judgment. Judgment is both, can be both for or against you. Their deliverance was a judgment in their behalf. From the Egyptian perspective, it was a judgment against them and the inhumane treatment that they had given to the people. I will be your God. I'll take you as my own people. Don't read past that too quickly. God said, I will take you on. You'll be my people. Well, I'll tell you, I have a lot of Israeli friends, or I have s several Israeli friends, and they will say to you, you know, it's not always such a good thing being chosen by God. Now, you and I, as in the Gentile world, have been grafted into that same covenant with Abraham. If you imagine yourself to be a Christ follower, you are God's people. 
You are not your own, the New Testament says. Don't you know you were bought with a price? Again, we, we've been a little off balance. We, we've, our, our faith has been so casual. I'll take you as my own people. I will be your God. There's a personal component. Says, I'll be your God. They know the gods of Egypt. They've got a plethora of them. I will be your God. I'll bring you to the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll give it to you as a possession. I promised it to Abraham, but now I'm going to give it to you. This is an intensely personal passage. And there's that one statement slipped in there. It's worth noting. He said, you will know that I am the Lord, your God. You will, by the time we're done with this journey, he said, you will know that you have a God. We have to wake up to that, that we have a God. And it isn't a government or a politician or a nation state. We have a God that transcends that, who secures our lives and our futures, to whom we give loyalty and allegiance. He sets the boundaries for our lives. He brings the moral perspectives to us. We don't dictate those to him. Now that's Exodus 6, 6 through 8. Look at verse 9, very next verse. Moses reported this to the Israelites. He told the Israelites what God had said to him. But they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and their cruel bondage. It's plain language. We understood it, and we're Tennesseans. <laughs> Me too. Don't be offended. But it says they couldn't listen. They couldn't hear because of discouragement. May I su submit to you that we need a plan for discouragement. It's an easy time to give in to discouragement. The struggle has lasted longer than we wish it were. Some of us are desperately trying to say we're back to normal. No, we're not. The, the, the ship that had normal written on it, they burned it when that thing from Wuhan rolled in here. It's not about a virus anymore, but we're not in that world anymore. And, and if you think you can reassemble the cast of characters that defined the world at that time and step back into that world, you are deluded. We need a plan for discouragement. I'll tell you what will help. That old prefix D-I-S means without. Disapproval means to be without approval. Discouragement means to be without courage. We're going to have to find the courage to choose the truth. So what causes you to be discouraged? Well, it isn't as easy as we would like it to be, or the adversary is persistent, or we get tired. All of those things are legitimate. They're all legitimate emotional responses. They're all accurate. They can be accurate physical descriptions. But the, the reality is the only way you gain physical strength is by exercising to the point of exhaustion. If you're not in the habit of exercising until you get tired, you're not gaining strength, you're losing it. It's true physically, it's true spiritually. If you're not accustomed to engaging in things spiritually that cause you to become weary, you are losing spiritual strength. And it's more, we're more easily discouraged. We have to learn how to encourage one another, to help one another, to encourage ourselves in the Lord. And then the cruelty that was around the people made it difficult for them to hear. Jesus in Matthew 24, he said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most would grow cold. And the word that's used for love there is the Greek word that's used for God's love. The love in the hearts of God's people will grow cold because of the increase of wickedness. We have to guard our hearts. Now, the big barrier they had to cross, really beyond Pharaoh and his authority, had to do with the choice of directions they went, but God led them until where the barrier between them and freedom was the Red Sea. It is one of the greatest deliverance stories in all of the Bible. In Exodus 13, it says, Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, from the house of, the slave, of slavery. By a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. By a powerful hand. The only way they could find freedom was through the powerful intervention of God. Folks, we have got to live with that. Our future depends upon the powerful intervention of God. That's true. We, we've spent too long. How many seminars have we gone to? How many studies have we done? 
How many discussions have we engaged in whether we talk about whether or not God still did miracles? Whether the age of miracles concluded with the last of the apostles or some such nonsense along those lines. And, and you may have been in one of those camps. It's okay. Now we can say to the Lord, Lord, we realize we're in a place where we desperately need to believe that your powerful hand is still with us. There is no satisfactory outcome that can be envisioned apart from the power of God being demonstrated on behalf of God's people. Don't wait until our nation looks like Ukraine to believe that. Start today. And if you've been in the other camp, quietly begin to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry that I had the imagination that I could secure my future or the future of my children or the future of my grandchildren. Lord, I'm sorry. The powerful hand of the Lord brought you out. Exodus 14, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after them and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. God said, because of the condition of Pharaoh's heart, all of Egypt will know there's a God. Woohoo! Lord, let all the earth know there's a God. Let all in our nation know there's a God. May your power be so evident that those who would plot or scheme against your purposes or withstand them or withhold them or try to diminish them, may your power be expressed in such a way that they will arrive at the conclusion that there is a God. That's the story of the one we worship. Amen. Amen. We've reduced it down to something else, but God hasn't reduced himself. Same chapter, verse 11, they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? Well, that wasn't all they said. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Folks, the barrier that was before them was not just the Egyptians or not just the water. It was within them. And the barriers we face are not just external. That's why I said don't be angry at people. Don't be belligerent. Don't be condemning. This is not about pointing through the windows of the church at the problem. It's about quietly beginning to say to the Lord, Lord, I have to have a change inside of me. I asked for freedom, I asked for deliverance, I asked for something different, but I didn't imagine you were gonna actually ask me to have to stand up. They wanted out of the brick pits, but they didn't, you know, they just thought maybe like an airlift. Kind of a Dorothy moment where you click your heels together. It's gonna be a recurrent theme. We're gonna talk about it more. They said, look, just leave us alone. And God said, no, 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 we joined this journey together. You'll have those days you'll think, Lord, I didn't know you meant this. I was so, I remember years ago when I said, you know, we were gonna reach people with the gospel. I just thought that meant, you know, if a few more people came to church, it just mean you had a little bigger crowd to talk to. It never occurred to me like their babies would need room in the nursery. Or we'd have to build a classroom for their kids where they need parking places. I didn't volunteer for construction management. I volunteered to help people get to know the Lord. Never occurred to me then people go, well, you know, that's just too big. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell me where that cutoff line was. I didn't understand. We'll stretch a rope across the lobby. Everybody on this side, you get to go to hell because we don't want to be too big. I mean, I was really naive. I didn't understand. It would be very misleading for me to suggest to you that, that I understood what it is meant to say yes to the Lord. And I, I've, I've walked the path long enough that I'm very confident today that I don't understand what it means to say yes to the Lord today. That he'll have new invitations before me. That will require a decision on my part to cooperate with him. I hope you understand that for yourself and you're not just ref reflecting on some historical experience. Exodus 14, Moses answered the people, don't be afraid, stand firm. Did you know we've been saying that to God's people for a while? Don't be afraid, stand firm. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see them again. And the Lord will fight for you and you need only to be still. 
Look at verse 15. It's my favorite in this little passage. And the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to get moving. I mean, Moses is looking at the water and he's going, uh, tell them to get moving. What are you talking to me for? Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. God says like that, it's like Moses has been doing that in the pool for years. Are we willing to learn? Are we willing to grow? Are we willing to face that discomfort? See, what's really awkward about if I pray for this, you know this. Why are we reluctant to have a let's pray moment? What if I pray and nothing happens? Maybe what's scary, what if I pray and something does? What if I tell somebody I want to pray and they ridicule me or they don't respond well and there's a complaint or it gets pushed up some chain of authority and there's reprimand or there's some consequence? Folks, that's what we're reading. They're in a place where there are consequences. Their faith isn't theoretical. We're going to have to break out of this place where our faith is just theoretical. We only talk about it in places where we know people will cheer for us or agree with us. Exodus 14, when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, put their trust in him, and in Moses, his servant. If you stopped at chapter 14, you'd think, well, happy ending. But they have a hard time holding a position. You know what that's. How many times have you said, I'm going to eat healthier? Then somebody gives you a donut. But it's kind of a healthy donut. Another component of this narrative, and I'm not going to build it out in a lot of detail because I I think you've read it enough, you're familiar, but one of the real challenges that the people have, and it it limits them, there's a great cost attached to it. It was related to us in the passage we read from Corinthians. Tens of thousands of people died because of this problem, this internal problem. It isn't external. It comes from within our hearts. The Exodus generation struggled mightily with grumbling and complaining. You know, if the the Red Sea narrative is in chapter 14 and in chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, there are grumbling narratives with consequences. In fact, you know, there's a portion there while the the, the Exodus text is focused on these plagues and the nature of the plagues and their outcome and Pharaoh's hard heart. And there's this contrast between God's invitation and Pharaoh's heart and And then we get to the Red Sea and the people waffle a little bit, but it says at the conclusion of chapter 14, they believed God and they were in favor of Moses. And then for five consecutive chapters, they're complaining about God and Moses. And then the, 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 the narrative changes pretty dramatically in his focus. It's not any longer about Pharaoh's heart. Once we cross the Red Sea, Pharaoh's old news. Egypt is decimated. Now it's about the hearts of God's people and they're just struggling a lot. They complain about God. They don't like the path he's chosen. They complain about Moses. They don't like his leadership style. I mean, they they complain about their diet. Exodus 17, the people were thirsty for water and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why'd you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Well, I don't really think Moses forced them to leave. But rather than accept any responsibility for their desire to be free, their desire to walk a new path, their desire to, to live a new life, they're uncomfortable and unhappy. And rather than accept any responsibility for it, they say, it's your fault. It's your problem. Sound familiar? And Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. Psalm 106 is not in your notes, but it is in your Bible. It says they grumbled in their tents and did not obey the Lord. You see, grumbling is the expression of disobedience. We grumble and we don't like the path God's got us on, so we complain about it. We chirp about it. We'll complain about the people involved in that pathway. We can make this really personal, but I don't want to take the time. They grumbled against the Lord. They grumbled against Moses. They grumbled against the, that the journey was too difficult. Who told them it was going to be easy? Who said, who said following the Lord was easy? 
Do you understand what a perverted gospel it is that tells us that the Son of God had to come to the earth and ultimately be tortured to death on a Roman cross just so you and I could upgrade the car we drive and the restaurants we eat in? Now, I'm not opposed to nice things. If yours bother you, bring them to me. <laughs> but that's not the goal of my faith. Who said this was easy? Jesus said, as a matter of fact, that in, in, we have to lay down our life. We have to take up our cross daily. Not a little piece of jewelry ornamentation. We have to yield ourselves, offer ourselves as a living sacrifice daily if we want to be his disciple. We should all be generous givers. We should all be generous servers. That's the nature of our faith. Well, maybe the newbies, the newcomers, the ones that are just processing it and just learning first time through the book, maybe. But if you're a veteran of any tenure whatsoever, these things should be normative in our lives. The people who work with you and live near you and interact with you, they should know what you believe. They should understand your moral perspective. It should be as readily a part of who we are as if you're a UT fan or an Alabama fan or a long-suffering Vanderbilt fan. <laughs> Let's talk about baseball. Makes sense? But we've distracted ourselves. Well, what I would really like to do is a verse-by-verse -verse exegetical study of the book of Romans in the original language. Well, honestly, I'd enjoy that myself. But that doesn't always translate into more fruitful Christianity. Well, I'm not opposed to detailed, careful study of Scripture. But I'm very interested in the fruitfulness of our spiritual lives. They grumbled about everything. They complained, this is too hard. We don't like our diet. Several hundred thousand people traveling through an area where there was neither a Costco nor a Sam's. <laughs> and God is feeding them. Their children are not going hungry. There's no sick people amongst them. And instead of saying, thank you, Lord, they complain about the menu. You mean like somebody sat in my seat or parked in my place? Well, that wasn't my favorite worship leader or they didn't sing the song I wanted. You mean like that? No, no, they're very different than us. <laughs> my time's about gone. I gave you an outline of Exodus. I thought as you read it, it might help you a bit. You can start to fill in some blanks. And as, as you're reading through the, the other books, oh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, you can, they'll overlap. The timelines will overlap a bit and you can fill in some of these stories more. Those first four chapters are Moses. You're introduced to Moses. He's an infant. His parents, they have the courage to hide him for a season and then they don't. And they put him in a basket in the river. I mean, we've romanticized that, but that's a pretty awkward thing. Moses was born in the time when many amongst the Hebrew people could not protect their children. Sound familiar? Chapters 5 through 13 have to do with the conflict with Pharaoh. Moses is on point by that time. And there's this con so those chapters are almost totally absorbed in the conflict between the plagues and the condition of Pharaoh's heart, and you can go and you can't go, and you put your right foot in and your right foot out. Chapters 14 and 15, we've looked at a bit, getting beyond the Red Sea. The Red Sea, once they were beyond the Red Sea, they were out of Pharaoh's reach. Uh, the, the Bible makes an analogy between going through the, the waters of the Red Sea and the waters of baptism. I think there's a completeness to your faith that comes with Christian baptism. Once you submit yourself to Christian baptism, that public acknowledgement of the Lordship of Jesus, I think you bring a separation from a past life. It's a very important part of your journey. I would again encourage you to, to say yes to the Lord. You can have a t-shirt and a towel tonight. Chapters 
16 to 18, I, I put those in kind of a special, they're kind of a little microcosm. In those chapters, we're introduced to manna, where they go to Mara, where the water is bitter. Mara is a transliteration. It's an English, they just took Hebrew letters and pulled them into English. The word means bitter. The first water they came to after the Red Sea, they couldn't drink it, and the people were ready to go back. 72 hours out, they said, maybe slavery is better. Let's get, have a little honest reflection for a moment. Have you ever looked at somebody that was ungodly and thought, that'd be easier? Yes, that's called temptation. So that we get manna, they go to Mara, water from the rock, they see another expression of God's provision. Not only does he provide food for them every day, He's able to provide water for them in a barren wilderness. If you've never been to the Negev, it is a barren, barren place. They have their first battle. They have, to, they have a conflict with the Amalekites. They've been slaves for hundreds of years. They're not trained in physical combat. And yet God gives them a victory. Moses' father-in-law shows up and he said that your, your workflow is all wrong. I mean, from the, from the least to the leader amongst them, they're having to reevaluate, they're having to change, they're having to grow. Remember what our theme is, it's time to lead. Folks, we're not looking for a pattern that we can replicate day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. We're looking for a God that we will follow. And we'll be willing to change and grow and adapt and learn and experience and trust. So well, wait a minute, Pastor, I just, I just thought maybe I want to go to heaven. Well, me too. But why would you want to go to heaven if you haven't learned to trust God and follow God and depend upon God? You're going to trust him with your eternity, but not trust him with your life in time? That's nuts. Amen. So we got a little trial period here where you get to know your God and you get to become his people. Chapter 19, we come to Mount Sinai and the whole, the, the narrative changes, not just in the book of Exodus, but it's going to change the narrative for the rest of the books of Moses. Because what happens at Sinai, in chapter 10, 20, you get the Ten Commandments. And God begins to say, you shall and you shall not. That being my people is not just about food and water and freedom. Being my people is about holiness and purity and righteousness. Well, we didn't know anything about that. I know, that's why he's saying, thou shall not and thou shall. The next five chapters are the community laws where God begins to tell them how to live in community. They know how to be slaves. They know how to be pagans. They know how to be under Egyptian authority. They don't know what it means to be the people of God. Neither do we. Or we wouldn't have been silent while they took Jesus out of our classrooms and out of the workplace and the corporate settings. They told us our faith wasn't welcome in the corporate settings and now the corporations are powerful advocates for ungodliness. Do we understand that our abdication is what has unleashed that? Lord, we are sorry. Be merciful to us. So those community laws, God begins to say, wait a minute, if we're going to be, you're going to be my people. This isn't arbitrary. It's not what you want to do or what you feel like doing. Let me help you understand. It's like trying to, to survive underwater. It's not what you feel like. It's what's necessary to flourish in that environment. We can't be the people of God on our terms. It won't work. Exodus 24, Moses went up on the mountain. The cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Moses stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. He got the blueprints for the tabernacle. He got the instructions for the priesthood. He was getting the, the rules about community life. God, is, he needs somebody. See, God works through people. He didn't deliver the Hebrew slaves from Egyptian torture in an arbitrary way. He didn't send the angels to do it. He moves through people. When we say that we have to have a change and it isn't going to begin politically, it has to begin in our hearts around our kitchen tables. Amen. It has to begin in our family system. It has to begin in our little community. Let's lead so well that God will be pleased to say, because of those people, let me get involved in a new way. Stop saying we're not enough. Stop saying we don't have enough influence. Stop saying it doesn't, people won't take my call. If the creator of heaven and earth will listen to your plea, start to talk to him. 
Chapters 25 to 31, they get the instructions for the tabernacle, the priestly garments. What it means, consecration is a big old fancy word to set yourself apart to God. Chapter 32, we got a little off ramp. Moses has been gone a while. So they make a golden image that looks like something they've seen in Egypt. But it isn't just the calf. They descend back into paganism, immorality, debauchery. They hear the noise up on Mount Sinai. They can't quite distinguish it. It's not clear enough, but when they get close enough, Moses said, that's a party. And he finds there and he says, what happened? And he said, well, they, they brought me their gold jewelry and I threw it in the fire and a calf came out. <laughs> Leadership matters. Because when Moses and Joshua got back, the party was over. Do we have the courage? Are we willing to say to the Lord, Lord, on our watch, we have descended into something that's not good. We've got to stop pointing accusing fingers and begin to talk to the Lord in some honest terms. By the time we get to chapter 40, there's only 40 chapters in Exodus. The tabernacle has been put in place. And God said, it's time to move now. You've got a place to worship. I've shown you the boundaries around worship. I've given you some job descriptions, some general rules for community. Now we're going to practice. Let's get on our way to the promised land. Let's get on our way to the promised land. You got the tools you'll need. If you'll take these things and you'll practice them with diligence, everything I said to you back there on the other side of the Red Sea, it's yours. It's within reach now. You've got the blueprint. You've got what you need. Let's go. Break camp, we're moving. Pillar of clouds moving. Pillar of fires moving. We're going. We're, we're on our way. And we'll talk about the rest of it next time. <laughs> or we could take another hour. No, we can't. There'd be a stream of children's workers start through these doors in about. You know. But here's our challenge. I think most of us would acknowledge we're in a place where we need God's help. My, my concern is, do we have the courage to say, God, let the change begin in us? Or are we wanting other people to change? We want the CDC to be different, or we want the politicians to be different. Whoever you don't like, you want them to be different. Are we willing to say to the Lord, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Forgive me. Forgive me. Are we willing to be different? Folks, that's our only pathway from here. The turmoil will escalate. Only the hand of God will interrupt it. It's not just another cycle. Or if it's understood in that way, it's a cycle that's so disruptive, it will disrupt your future and your children and your grandchildren's future. But God, we're not powerless. The one who created heaven and earth is our God. He calls us his people. Why don't you stand with me? Father, thank you for your word, for its truth and power and authority, for the insight it brings to us. Lord, I thank you that just as you call the, the Hebrews out of Egyptian slavery, that you are calling in the earth once again to deliver your people from the bondage of darkness. Lord, one decision at a time, one day at a time, we have yielded the field and to the point we, did, we weren't aware and we, we lost balance and forfeited perspective, but in your great mercy, you've begun to awaken us and we thank you for it. We praise you for it, Lord, that we're developing understanding hearts and we're beginning to distinguish shape and hear sounds again. We thank you for your great mercy. Holy Spirit, help us. May a spirit of humility and repentance and the fear of the Lord come to us. 
May those that we see presenting for baptism grow and be multiplied. May we use our voices to stand up for the truth, to acknowledge sin. Forgive us for encouraging it. Whether we have done it directly or with our silence, forgive us. May the name of Jesus be lifted up. May your will be done around us. We praise you for it. We give you thanks, Lord. We thank you that you're a God who delights in showing mercy, that you're a God who delivers and redeems and restores and heals. We praise you for it. We thank you that it's your delight to let your strength be made evident in the earth. And Lord, we cry out to you today. Help us to walk in such a way that it would please you, that your power and majesty and glory might be made evident in our midst. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.